It's in the interwar novel rather than architectural or urban histories, which scarcely existed then, that one can find the most sustained critique of the modern Australian city. The women writers responsible for the majority of these novels embrace modernist content, but also modernist narrative techniques and style. This is particularly the case with Eleanor Dark, a Sydney-born writer who came to fame in the 1930s with a series of experimental and overtly modern works. Seven of her ten novels had contemporary themes. The others formed a historical trilogy of which The Timeless Land, the first of the three, is the best known. Tom Griffiths has noted that Dark, quote, a novelist was probably Australia's most influential historical writer of the 20th century, end of quote. Translated into many languages, The Timeless Land introduced many foreigners to Australia and many Australians to their own history. In 1923, Dark and her husband, Eric Dark, had bought Varuna in Katoomba in the Blue Mountains in New South Wales, and from her, and this is a quote, high white sanctuary on the sandstone plateau, Dark imagined looking out towards the breaking wave of British colonisation on the eastern shore, and in three long books written over a decade and a half, described the incoming invasion until it was lapping at the base of her own mountain. Return to Coolamai, published in 1936, preceded the historical novels by a few years, yet it contains the germ of the idea that was to become the central theme of the timeless land, that is the incursion, the invasion from east to west. The literary form it took, however, was the road novel, a new genre developed in and identified with America. A recent attempt to identify Australian examples of the type omitted Dark's novel, nominating Eve Langley's The Pea Pickers of 1942 as the earliest example. The road novel is, quote, the automat automotive version of the journey narrative, borrowing elements from its two major variants, the romance or noble quest and the picaresque, with its chance encounters and roguish characters. American writer Sinclair Lewis's Free Air of 1919 is generally regarded as the first road novel, quote, establishing the defining theme of the genre, the technologized escape from the constraints of civilization to the freedom of the open road. This flight is also the central paradox in the genre since drivers, in their dependence on automotive technology, bring with them the civilization they flee, end of quote. In a bid to force her father to, to take a break from work, Claire Boltwood ships their car, a so-called Gomez Depp, from Brooklyn Heights, New York, where they live, to Minneapolis, where they've gone to oversee a branch of the family firm. As the Gomez Depp is not a known make, make of car, it's clearly meant to, meant to represent the finest um, car to be had at the time. This is a quote, one of the best cars in the world imported from France with an American-made body. From there they set out for Seattle, a cross-country trip of over 1,500 um, miles through North Dakota, Yellowstone, Washington State. The trip from east to west, from sophisticated New York to newly rich and upwardly mobile Seattle, through the wheat belts of Dakota and the wonders of Yellowstone, is laden with metaphorical significance. En route, the east, represented by Claire Boltwood and her industrialist yet surprisingly supine father, who does, does almost nothing in the entire novel, meets the Midwest, the true America, in the form of Milton Daggett, the hard-working, intelligent, decent, heart of gold owner of a small profitable garage in the forgettable village of Schoenstrom in Minnesota, and you can I presume that's an illustration of his garage. This is a novel about the discovery of America, of the West by Claire and of the East by Milt. Quote, on the evening before Claire Boltwood left Minneapolis and ventured into democracy, Milt was in the garage. He wore union overalls that were tan where they were not grease black, a faded blue cotton shirt, and the crown of a derby with rim not too heat, neatly hacked off with a dull toad stabber jackknife. Daggett, having fallen for Claire at first sight, when she and her father had stopped to refuel at his garage, abandons his business to his partner and follows his heart across America in a tiny car he calls a teal bug, which Darrell has suggested is actually a deal, a type of uh, car briefly made in America at this time. Saving the Easterners from various dangers along the way as is bound by the literary laws of the picaresque novel. But two things distinguish this novel. The first chapter must be unique in Western literature in that it consists almost exclusively of a description of a woman driving over terrible Minnesota roads, battling with the new machine while her father is ferried along in silence doing absolutely nothing. And I'll just, oh, this is really quite amazing. Anyway, um, I'll just read a bit of it. I'll probably run out of time reading all this stuff, but it is quite striking. This is a quote. 
When the wheels struck the slime, they slid, they wallowed. The car skidded. It was terrifyingly out of control. It began majestically to turn toward the ditch. She fought the steering wheel as though she were shadow boxing, but the car kept contemptuously staggering till it was sideways, straight across the road. Somehow it was back again, eating into the rut, going ahead. She didn't know how she'd done it, but she'd got it back. She longed to take time to retrace her own cleverness in steering. She didn't. She kept going. The novel's modernity is played out in the long descriptions of the new woman, fighting with and controlling this technology, which she does successfully throughout the novel. Indeed, Claire was not unique in this school. In the early years of the 20th century, women were enthusiastic motorists. When they had access to a car, and that generally meant they had to learn how to fix it when it broke down and generally deal with the mechanicals. Um, Sinclair Lewis was also alert to the ways in which automotive culture had shaped new experiences and possibilities across the American continent. For example, there's the camaraderie of road travel. Um, Claire had discovered too that she could adventure, no longer was she haunted by the apprehension that had whispered to her as she left Minneapolis. She knew a thrill when she hailed as though it were a passing ship, an Illinois car across whose dust-caked back was a banner, Chicago to the Yellowstone. She experienced a new sensation of common humanness when, on a railway paralleling the wagon road for miles, the engineer of a freight waved his hand to her and tooted the whistle in greeting. Then there's the seduction of the long distance drive. To the Easterner, a drive from New York to Cape Cod over Asheville is viewed as heroic. But here were cars that had started casually on a thousand mile vacations. She kept pace not only with large cars touring from St. Louis or Detroit to Glacier Park and Yellowstone, but she also found herself companionable with families of workmen headed for a new town on a new job and driving because a fliver bought second hand and soon to be sold again was cheaper than trains. Then there was the new type of the tourist or camper, a sort of 20th century mechanized version of the westbound adventurer that we know from the Western frontier novels and films. She saw a dozen camping devices unknown to the East, trailers, uh, which by day bobbed along behind the car like coffins on two wheels, but at night opened into tents with beds, an icebox and table. Tents covering a bed whose head rested on the running board. Beds made up in the car with cushions as mattresses. The rapid transformation of road travel from horse and wagon to motor car and the new forms of mobility and sociability um, it had allowed is quintessentially, and I'm really upset that Graham has stolen my thunder here. Really upset me. Anyway, of course, we now know that this is the first autopic person <laughs> toad. And in the <laughs> I've got it 1980, you said 192. 192 is even more amazing, but um, the great utopic toad. Autopic, sorry, autopic toad. In the space of a moment, an enchanting encounter with a speedy vehicle has transformed the proud, from the proud owner of a canary-coloured caravan to an irrepressible speed fiend obsessed with motor cars, the only way to travel, here today, in next week, tomorrow. And that conquering of time and space is the words that will ricochet down the decades um, through road novels and, of course, in futurist manifestos and the rest. While Claire observes, as Barry Humphreys pointed out many decades ago, Toad was the first futurist. While Claire observes the social transformations afforded by the motor car, uh, Lewis throws a spotlight on other aspects of automotive culture through the eyes of Milt Daggett. For example, they're the automotive garages like Milt's, which were already a recognisable type dotted across the country. And indeed, the title of the novel, Free Air, refers to an amenity garage as provided, and Claire used the phrase to describe her adventure. While Claire takes, uh, takes to car travel with ease and enjoys the power and speed of her car, Minnesota-born Milt is seduced by the new forms of competitive sport as he observes a car speeding past at one point. And he sounds a bit like Toad here. May be a it may be a transcontinental racer, be in New York in five days, going night and day, take mud at 50 an hour, crack mechanic right from the factory, change tyres in three minutes, people waiting up all night to give him gasoline and a sandwich. That's my idea of fun. There are also the possibilities of work for him in Detroit, already the centre of America's automotive industry, although he finally enrols in mechanical engineering um, degree in Seattle to make him more worthy of Claire. Having arrived in Seattle, looking, for a, uh, looking to park the Gomez debt for the uh, family, Tura, in a, in a public garage, Milt comes face to face with what we might classify as a, a slice of autopia. 
an automatic parking system. And this is a quote. It was the public garage which finally crushed him. This is the boy from Minnesota. It was a garage of enamel brick and coloured tiles with a plate glass enclosed office in which, work, um, work, in which worked young med, men clad as, as the angels. One of them wore a carnation, Milt noted. Milt drove up the brick incline into a room thousands of miles long with millions of new and recently polished cars standing in lines as straight as the running board. He begged of a high-nosed colour, coloured functionary, not in khaki overalls but in maroon livery. Where shall I put this boat? The Abyssinian prince um, gave him a check and in a tone of extreme lack of personal interest snapped, take it down the aisle to the elevator. Meekly, he drove past cars so ebon and silvery, so smug and strong. Um, another attendant waved him into the elevator and Milt tried, to not, tried not to look surprised when the car started, not forward but upward, as though it had turned into an aeroplane. And apparently the first um, APS, as they were called, was made in Paris in 1905, and I don't think one was actually erected in Seattle till somewhat later than 1919, which is when this is set. So this is a bit of utopian thinking, I think. Free Air is a romantic tale, but it's also probably the first novel dedicated to the motor car. Free Air was made into a film in 1922, and one must suppose that Eleanor Dark knew the work as a book or a film, as she both as she did enjoy the cinema. Sinclair Lewis was a popular American writer of novels, um, short stories and plays, and he won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1930, so he would have been known to such a wide um, reader as Dark. And Return to Cool Am I shares some of the uh, features which Lewis's pioneering work um, exposed us to. Its protagonists, a well-to-do middle-class family who take a road trip out west, in this case from Sydney, over the Blue Mountains to Cool Am I. But whereas in free air, the problems of modernity are largely thematized through the imagery of the automobile and automotive culture wrapped in a romantic tale, in dark, modernity is an unresolved psychological state. Dark introduced in her novel a number of modernist literary techniques, quite apart from pioneering a new literary genre. And these have been recognized um, in literary criticism of dark for a number of years now. For example, she was observed early on to have used in this novel the um, um, stream of consciousness, consciousness uh, way of, of writing, a term that was uh, coined by William James in 1890 and, in, and employed by people like Marcel Proust and James Joyce and Virginia Woolf and so on, all of whom um, um, Dark would have read. And she uses the stream of consciousness in her novel to move back and forth through time organically rather than chronologically <coughs> as she reveals the entanglements of this family, the Drew family. And another reviewer um, found that the novel owed quite a lot to cinematic technique. And um, in fact, in a recent article, Melinda Cooper has discussed Dark's attitude to modernism, including the cinema, in detail. She doesn't mention the road novel at all. Um, Dark, as I said, did enjoy the cinema, and the cinematic version of the road novel, that's road films, may well have suggested some of the thematic choices she made in her novel. Like the road novel, the ra road film is an American innovation, and it typically contains an episodic journey or quest on an open road to search for or an escape or to engage in a quest of some kind of a goal, um, either a distant destination or the attainment of love, freedom, mobility, redemption, all of those sorts of things. And the road functioned as a testing ground or proving ground for the main characters. And it happened one night is a typical or very early version of the uh, road film and some of its themes um, are taken up by Dark in her novel. I won't go into them because I'm sure I'm going to run out of time. So I had to read the book with that revolting cover on it. I haven't got the first edition, but anyway. Return to Coolamai opens as Brett McLean arrives in Sydney from his property Coolamai to collect his wife Susan, who's been staying with her wealthy parents, Tom and Millicent Drew, in their comfortable Sydney home. Susan had just recovered from the death of her infant son, whose father was Brett's brother, Jim McLean. Jim had been killed when he crashed his sports car. To avert a scandal of the unmarried 21-year-old socialite having an illegitimate child, Brett and Susan marry. The romantic triangle of Susan and the brothers is the knot to be untied and resolved along the road on the trip west uh, that the family takes in Tom Drew's new so-called Madison tourer. Susan did not love Jim, who she was having an affair with, but he loved her. 
Susan does love Brett, but he doesn't love her and blames her for his brother's death. That's the triangle. The resolution to this emotional dilemma um, comes about in true road novel fashion at a stop along the way which occupies in fact a third of the novel. The family visits Colin Drew, Susan's brother, on the property he runs with his father Marjorie. Colin's an alcoholic, this is nothing if not a modern novel, um, with a habit of disappearing for periods of time, leaving his wife in charge, and uh, things obviously aren't going terribly well. He's not there to greet his family and that night Brett divines that Colin has disappeared up the mountain Jungaburra where Colin often retreats to a cave, presumably to drink. Reluctantly, Brett, in the night, embarks on a rec rescue mission and there's a long descriptive piece in the book of the brothers-in-law struggling around the precipitous mountain trying to get down in the dark. Alarmed that the men are losing and in are lost and are in danger, Susan follows them in the car in the Madison, trains the car lights onto the mountain, cleverly, then nimbly climbs up to help them to the ground, a competent competence which initially infuriates her husband. Susan's rescue mission though, uh, through the bush gashes the bonnet of the car and dents a mudguard and this provides the transformative moment of their journey east, west, where Jungabara asserts its power over industrialised modernity. The episode signal, signals Susan's re reconciliation with the idea of living in remote Coolamai, Brett's dawning love for his wife and Tom Drew's relationship to Australia's past and his own identity. As the family makes ready to continue the journey to Coolamai, Tom doesn't say a word about the new dent in one of the front, front, front mudguards, nor about the great horizontal scar along the once immaculate paintwork of the bonnet. That's a quote. Dark infers that these are Jungabara's marks. When they had left Sydney the day before, Tom Drew had mused aggressively on some of the place names that they passed by. There's another of them, Parramatta. What a silly sound, a jabbering sound, the kind of sound a child might make by experimenting with vocal noises. And over there to, uh, to his left, still another, Kirribilli. Well, they sound exactly as they were, the language of savages. As they travel further west from Sydney, doubts begin to form. Quote, Name shone, shone up at him out of the golden lamplight, tantalising mysteries hidden from him behind the soft syllables of an alien tongue. Gulgong, Dunadu, Merigoan, Turawena, no, these weren't bad names. So there was a sort of music in them, difficult, elusive, like the difficult and elusive beauty he'd discovered that morning in the bush. And still the road went on. After the episode on the mountain, the dent in the mudguard could be said to describe metaphorically the dent in Drew's hitherto unassailable views about himself and the past, about time and history. Quote, back there on Jungabara, he reflected, an ancient people had seen spirits God only knew how many centuries ago. In the mountains, the records of a thousand years were written across the cliff faces, and in the gullies, through a dim green light and on soft earth that gave out a damp, rich smell, you might walk under fern trees whose ancestors had been fern trees before you grew legs and came to live on dry land. Here we see the germ of the timeless land, that novel that was so famous, being worked out in, in its very origins in this novel, this road novel that travels from east to west. Interestingly, these music on place names also came from Sinclair Lewis, I'm pretty sure. In a late passage in Free Air, Claire, driving through Washington State, had found high intellectual benefit in studying the names of towns in the state of Washington. Not Kankakee, not Kalamazoo or Oshkosh can rival the picturesque fancy of Washington and Claire combined the town names in a lyric so emotion-stirring that it ought perhaps to be the national anthem. That's obviously a quote. And I won't read all of this. That's what then comes in the novel. This list of names denotes the multi-ethnic uh, multi America, English, Native American, versions of European, Japanese, a theme close to Lewis's heart and democratic beliefs. In both novels, therefore, the road trip is a journey into national history and identity, and I suspect Dark used Lewis's ideas for her own ends. Ultimately, her meditations on Australia's past are more radical than those of Lewis, and I think more fruitful, certainly for her own work. Now, in conclusion, something about the car, since this is an automotive historian's conference. From the point of view of automotive history, a comparison between the first two chapters of these novels is revealing. In the 1919 Free Air, the car is a central figure, it's French, could be based on something like this. It was obviously a fictitious car. 
but primarily as a piece of machinery with which Claire does battle and conquers. 17 years later, in return to Coolamai, it's a piece of design. Quote, waiting outside the gate, its hood folded down, its luggage carrier laden, its green body shadowy, shining like a mirror, like a limpid pool. End of quote. The contrast more or less encapsulates the design history of the automobile, which was transformed during the 1920s from an, from an assemblage of mechanised parts into the object of desire, as Penny Spark has noted in her groundbreaking history of automotive design. Free Air has two main automotive protagonists, the luxurious Gomez Depp, a mascot of Eastern wealth, and the teal bug, a bitza that, quote, lacked not only top and side curtains, but even windshield and running board. It was a toy, a cardboard box on toothpick axles. Strapped to the bulging back was a wicker suitcase partly covered by a tarpaulin. And this is the little car that keeps on rescuing the Gomez debt from fates worth and death. They obviously represent the relative status of their owners, and the small car is given the final word as it transports Claire and Milt into marriage and their future. In return to Coolamai, Tom Drew's new Madison Tourer, like the Gomez Depp, uh, a fictional make, but based on the Rolls Royce, clearly, is an emblem of his success as a man and breadwinner, not born into wealth like his wife, but finally able to buy the best house in Balool, the latest model Madison, his wife fur coats, and his son a country property. Yet as the journey takes hold of him, and the country and Aboriginal names begin to undermine his confidence, the car diminishes in stature and significance. Its counterpoint is Jim McClay's sports car, in which he and Susan had, quote, torn up and down from Sydney to Coolamai, from Coolamai to Sydney, as though the 300 odd miles were across the road and back end of quote. A symbol of their flawed relationship, it dies with Jim in the crash. Thus, while in free air, the automobile survives as an heroic harbinger of the future, in return to Coolamai, the automobile is annihilated by human desire and imperfect knowledge. Thanks.